The Unshackled Waves, episode 92. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. We've got another interview show coming up. Now, for those of you who don't know, The Unshackled isn't my first foray into alternative media. For two years, I was a contributor to Taking Liberties Radio, which is an Australian libertarian podcast hosted by Lee Heritage and Vikas Nayak. It is probably the standard bearer for mainstream libertarian thought and opinion in Australia. As I still consider myself a libertarian, I thought I'd invite on one half of the Taking Liberties team, Lee Heritage, to see where they are right now, discuss the state of the liberty movement in Australia, and as well as areas of thought where we agree and some where we disagree. Lee also runs a YouTube uh, channel called Aussie Liberty, where he offers his thoughts on the issues of the day from a libertarian point of view. He was also one of my debating opponents at the recent Australia and New Zealand Students for Liberty debate on the question of whether nationalism is good for liberty back at the Friedman Conference earlier this year. So we have some history of adversity, but we still consider each other on the same side. Lee, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Now, before we start, I, I just want to make clear there was never any bad blood when I left uh, Taking Liberties to create The Unshackled. There wasn't a, uh, a moment where I said, you know, screw you, I'm, you know, creating my own, you know, web podcasting uh, platform. It's just that... That although, would have made for a more interesting story. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was more, even though, like, I enjoyed debating you and uh, Vickers, uh, I wanted yep. a platform where I could... Uh, set the agenda and you know, put my views forward more prominently. Yeah, no, I totally understand that. I mean, I started the Aussie Liberty Facebook page and sort of YouTube channel for the same sorts of reasons. It's like, you know, sometimes you just want to kind of do things on your own. And, and that's one of the great things about podcasting. So, yeah, there was never any bad blood and there's always a standing invite for you to return. And I think I've even asked you if you wanted to come and join us a couple of times. Um, and it was great. I mean, I, I had a great time being on the show with you. So I'm glad that I can come and be on your show because it's exciting. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, I, I've wanted to come back on Taking Liberties, but there's, uh, as always, scheduling yeah, uh, conflicts. Uh, but I thought this would be a good chance to uh, catch up and see where uh, Taking Liberties Radio is at the moment. So, but we'll st- I don't think I ever asked you, even you know, off off air, how did uh, Taking Liberties get started? Because I believe you're up to season four now. Yep, so we, we, I think we just recorded our 29th episode of, of season four. It wasn't actually started by me, it was started by Vickers and some others, but basically by the end of their kind of season one, they'd done about nine episodes, they struggled to get people together. Um, and I mean, as you would well know, anybody who wants to start a podcast, like having people who reliably turn up is one of the hardest things uh, to have. You know, having somebody you can regularly do content with is really important. Uh, and so I just said, I was already podcasting. I, I did a League of Legends podcast, which is a video game. Uh, I was at the point where I was like, hey, I kind of want to talk about this libertarian stuff. And so I said to Vickers, uh, who I, I think I met at the first Freedman, but I wasn't you know, close with us. Uh, I remember them doing like a live stream and sort of asking a bunch of questions because I was still sort of quite early on in my libertarian thinking and sort of said the following year, look, I do podcasting. I'll show up every week. I'm keen to do it. And Vickers is like, yeah, sure. So it kind of uh, like I've found over the years that podcasting is a very organic thing. It kind of people come and go and yeah, as we were just saying, you know, like people can come and go and they do different things and they get busy. And, and so it was really just a kind of happy coincidence that I came on board uh, at the start of their second year. Um, So, uh, and since then we've done, managed to have, you know, be pretty reliable, especially last year and this year. Uh, I think last year we had about 28 episodes and this year we're on track to do sort of 30 something. So that's really good. It's always encouraging when you can sort of make it happen. Um, and yeah, it's always just been a case of see who's around, see who wants to talk. Um, it's it's always been a very casual thing, um, and that's that's one of the great things about podcasts. And I think I think that comes across well when it's just an organic thing, when it's just people are just talking. Um, Especially when, you know, like if you're not busting the, the bank with uh, with viewers, you know, it's uh, much easier to get away with maybe being a little bit more uh, casual. I'm sure for, you know, guys like uh, or like the Ruben Report or those sorts of YouTube channels, like they're very regimented and very sort of organized. But uh, for us uh, regular folk, 
uh, it's nice to just sort of have it being free flowing and and I, I mean over the hopefully in the next couple of years we're hoping to sort of step it up and and maybe get a bit more organized and get a bit more structured uh, I guess uh, well I'm sure you have much the same you know if we had the opportunity to do this as a semi real time you know real job thing or even as a full time job thing I think we uh, a lot of us would love to do it and so you got to kind of think about well how can you step it up just in case you do want to go down that path um, so yeah that's that's how it's all been it's all been well. Both Vickers and I are pretty casual guys, so just uh, we play it as as we see it. Uh, that's always the the difficult thing when you're starting out because you've all got uh, day jobs, and so coordination yeah. is half the thing. Uh, with the the unshackled waves, I like to be a bit more uh, prepared, mainly because so I always have a oh I've got a running sheet in front of me right now because I always want to make sure that you know I make all the the points that that need to be made. So yeah. so that's probably. So, something that I, you know, s- stepped up when I created the Unshackled. And you normally, because I don't know, I always listen, but you, you normally have guests on, don't you, as well? Yeah. Uh, it's so we mix yeah. it up. Just uh, so we, yeah, we we copied the uh, the Taking Liberties uh, <laughs> format and then yeah. mi- uh, mixed it in with you know uh, an interview format with with guests yeah. every week. So we yeah. we. we, we uh, uh, probably the having the the guests on was probably I took that from Tom Woods's podcast. So yep. taking the best of everything and putting it together. Yeah, I mean, I think for a lot of people, like when you hear podcasts, you think, "Man, I wish I could do this myself." And the great thing is, it's so easy; you can do it. So for me, it was Econ Talk. That's what kind of what got me into libertarianism, and I think it's just one of the best podcasts out there. And 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 a part of it is that Russ is a great interviewer, and so it's something I try to aspire to. Uh, with what he does is he's always very generous with his guests, even with people you know that he's like itching to disagree with. Like he's always just trying to like let people have their opportunity to speak. So uh, we're, I mean, we have some interviews, like it's not as often, I guess it sort of depends on when we come across somebody with something like we want to talk about. So right now we're trying to organize an interview with um, uh, with uh, Ziv, Ziv Vinikurov, who's one of our regular hosts, and also Michael Tice, who's a lawyer in Sydney. They both do family law. We want to talk about kind of same-sex marriage and family law. And in that sort of format, it'll be much more, probably a bit more like what you do with the Unshackled Waves. So um, it is, it's, yeah, for anybody who's thinking of doing podcasting, like literally just see what you like, think, I want to do that myself and just give it a crack. I mean, it's it's often very straightforward and not very expensive to get going. Um, and once you get reliable and once you get, you know, you find that you're doing it every week, then you can sort of think about, well, how can I take this to the next level? Uh, it's a wonderful medium like that. Uh, with, with us at the beginning, it was definitely a uh, you know trial, trial and error at, at the beginning. Yeah. Don't don't listen to like the first twelve episodes; they're terrible. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's uh, I mean it's it's one of the great joys of it is that there is so much. Uh, you know, sometimes you have dud episodes. Like sometimes you sort of get to the end of it and you think, yes, that was like amazing, and you have great conversations. And other times you're like, yeah, that's a bit of crap. But you know, that's that's how it works. Like it's just all about giving it a go and, uh, you know, I mean, I think you can sort of get web hosting for like five bucks a month or 10 bucks a month, depending on how much traffic you've got, you know, uh, you can set up WordPress, um, you know, using, I mean, you can get a cheap desktop mic for like 20 bucks if you really want to go lo-fi, you know, and, and even a good one, like the one that I'm using right now, I think it was only about $160 or something. So it's not, not horrendously expensive to kind of look okay and sound okay. Um, and I mean, all I can say is if, if you're interested in starting a podcast, hit me up, just like message the, the, uh, the taking liberties radio Facebook page, or I'm sure you'd be able to field questions as well about some of what you do. So just ask people, I, I'm, I'm always keen to help anybody who's wanting to give it a go. And, uh, when I come across people who I say I'm starting a podcast, I'm like, Oh, this is what I know. This is what I do. Do you want to, do you, do you want somebody to come on? Um, even, well, even like, uh, Aaron Ross Powell, who hosts one of the hosts of um, uh, Free Thoughts, which is the, one of the Cato podcasts. He's starting his own podcast that's kind of about other stuff, you know, not necessarily politics. And, and I'm like, oh, look, I'd love to come on, you know, because I just, as somebody who would love to have more people come on my show, like having people volunteer to come on your show is, I find a joy. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's that's always awesome when that happens. Now, uh, obviously, I've mentioned you've um, uh, you've had four seasons so far, but mm-hmm. your uh, I hope you don't mind me saying your following is still reasonably uh, small. Would you like to yeah. change that eventually? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is we haven't really we certainly haven't spent any money on advertising, um, and uh, I mean, I, for me, I'm not too worried about that. I mean, because in, in a lot of ways, it's 
uh, it's a personal project. Like, you know, you do it because it's fun and, you know, it's unlikely. I mean, you could be optimistic, but I'm unlikely to change the world from, from where I'm sitting right now. So I kind of, I'm not too worried about it. I guess I'm more, I'm more keen to find people who might be interested in what we're trying to do. Uh, and yeah, we, we are looking to step it up. Um, trying to sort of be more organized, be more structured, have actually have more guests on because I, I think that is actually a good way of growing your, your listener base because what they do is if you've got somebody who's got, you know, 10,000 followers, say I was on this show, then their followers are going to hear and maybe a few of them might stick around. So uh, I'm sure a lot of, uh, you know, for those who don't have kind of an inherent listener base or haven't developed them, I mean, even like an Econ Talk or a Tom Wood show, like when they started out, I imagine some of it was the quality of the guests they got on board, kind of bringing their own uh, listenership on. So, yeah, I mean, I, we are looking to sort of uh, push it forward um, and also just improve the quality of like the look of everything. I mean, we've basically got graphics that have just kind of been botched up, you know, like, uh, you know, stuff we've sort of sourced very cheaply uh, and, and that stuff costs money. I mean, if you want to get good graphics, it's not a cheap thing. So... Yeah, we're, we're sort of looking to see how we can improve the look of it. And uh, I mean, I think in terms of like the, the sound quality for me, because we're primarily a podcast as opposed to a YouTube channel, I mean, we do record things and put them on YouTube. Um, I've always been really fussy about trying to get the best quality audio, um, just because I think crappy sounding audio is like really, really not great. Like, I just, I mean, it makes me not want to listen to a podcast. So I think for me, that's probably been the main thing that I've tried to look to improve. And, and actually, I was saying just before we started about Zencaster, which is a great service. If, if anybody's looking to start a podcast, Zencaster is a, a, something that I've found helpful. So, yeah, I mean, in some ways, a little bit build it and, and you know, see if they come. Um, but, yeah, we, I mean, it, it's sort of like unless you've got a huge budget and you're willing to take it, you know, take it to that sort of level, uh, a lot of the bigger podcasts are going to be people who already will have a following. So someone like Tom Woods, like it wasn't like he was a nobody. He was already quite prominent within those circles, starting his own show and getting on all of the Mises Institute crowd into his show is going to be like an easy way to get bit, build it up. Um, and I mean, I guess maybe someone like Rush Roberts is a bit more, um, he would have been less well known, but because he's been going for so long, like he's probably one of the original kind of podcasts out there uh, that's going to have a following in and of itself. So uh, I think it's it's you got to see it as a long term thing as well. It's not just well we're gonna get a fancy new graphics and like you know we're gonna have a thousand listeners tomorrow. Like it's uh, you sort of gonna work for a sustainable future. I don't know. It seems a bit. Hopefully that answered the question. <laughs> yeah, well, there are some uh, success stories of you know nobody is becoming internet sensations. I mean, you look at although they're not podcasters, you look at Bearing and Independent Man, how successful they've become. Sure. Yep. I mean, in some ways, I think part of, and maybe this comes down to my own personality, and, and I'm sure we'll talk about it more, uh, about sort of culture. Like, I think a lot of that stuff, they have a lot of interest. Like, you know, I'll put it quite bluntly. I mean, I think the culture wars generates a lot of interest. You know, if you, if you have a certain approach and a certain style, that's going to have a lot of interest. By comparison, I mean, I think Vickers and I and Zeev, we're, we're quite, in, you know, we sound okay. It's not like we're, we sort of talk boring in a boring fashion. But we go about things in a, in a very kind of cerebral libertarian fashion. Um, and I, I'm, yeah, where I think it's if you're sort of going for something more emotive, something more kind of interesting, you know, which, I mean, personality conflicts and getting stuck into lefties and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I, I won't deny and I, I don't even disapprove that it generates interest. I mean, if that's what the thing is, I think you're going to go for what's passionate for you. Like if you're, you know, if your passion is that stuff, I say do a podcast about that stuff. Like that's, and that's why I was great, like always happy when you did the Unshackled because I'm like, this is your passion. And I, I think that's great, even if I disagree on, on what it's about. Um, for, for others of us who are not into that sort of thing, then we just got to do what we're passionate about and try and be excited about it. And hopefully that will draw a different crowd. And in the end, if we became successful, I suspect the crowd that would be into what we're doing would be different from, say, you know, the independent man or through other sort of creative outlets where they're, they're doing what they're passionate about and it's drawing a certain crowd. You know, maybe, I guess maybe I'd end up hoping to be more like Russ Roberts than, uh, than you know, say, the independent man or something like that. So uh, in some ways, we're sort of going about it different, differently. And I guess over time, as I mean, for myself, you know, I'm doing, I'm in the middle of an undergraduate economics degree. Uh, I'm hoping that my own knowledge will sort of advance to the point where I can start taking on more interesting content. You know, we can interview more high level people 
and and deliver sort of a different sort of program. Um, yeah, so I think yeah, I mean you're right. Like obviously, if you there's lots of people who become successful, even like young people, like for someone like Lauren Southern, who I don't like at all. She's what like 23, 24 or something. I mean that's uh, leaving aside the question of whether I think people should be consulting with twenty four year olds about like deep p- political stuff. Uh, maybe that's a bit snobby on my part, but I mean I still admire like the ability to create that. You know, like I think. You know, it's really hard to create content that people are interested in. Like if ever, if anybody could do it, everybody would do it. You know, that's why I don't like pop stars who create, you know, churn records out of the record factory. I look at that and think, okay, it's not my my taste, but like that still takes effort. That still takes work. Like you still need to know how to do that thing to do it well and to get interest. And that's respectable kind of in and of itself. So, you know, like a Lauren Southern or someone like that, where they're like, Creating content that people are interested in, it's because they know something. They have something to contribute that people want, and that's valuable. That's just not the path that I'm interested in taking. Uh, and maybe that means that we'll never be particularly, like, we're just too niche. You know, that's that's okay. I'm okay with that. Um, I think you've just got to sort of find the opportunities the best that you can. And, and I mean, in the long term, I guess, somewhere where I'd like to take the show uh, might kind of end up having maybe a more mainstream appeal. Um, I think if we, one of the things we've talked about, and you might have even been part of these discussions, was we were talking about having like a daily sort of uh, stream, live stream. You know, something like that might offer where you're sort of having a a daily breakdown of the events. Maybe that might be of interest to some people. We can go about it in a a different sort of way than the the weekly discussion, which is often kind of very much about economics and, you know, kind of cerebral stuff. Uh, Well, maybe not cerebral because we're pretty lowbrow, but uh, certainly kind of going about it in in a particularly kind of, a particular fashion, you know, if that's like, if you maybe like a, the Cato, if you want to break it down into a kind of libertarian tribe, you've kind of got the, the, the Cato Institute kind of model. And that's the kind of model that I've been influenced by. So that's kind of what we go for. Do you think that maybe like, because as you said, you're like, consider yourself very niche. Do you think it's still the fact that there's you know, not many libertarians in Australia, that libertarianism is, you know, too small? Uh, you know, we have the, you know, Freedom Conference, you know, every year, which mm. we all love and enjoy, but sort of the, it's still, we're, we're still a very small community. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's always going to be a, a difficulty. I mean, when I was doing my League of Legends podcasting, uh, I never we we sort of focus on the Australian scene, and that was never going to go anywhere really. I mean, the the best opportunity w- would have been for me is to get a job with the creator, the, the company that made the game. That was really the best way forward. Uh, and for a lot of things in Australia, the best way to succeed is to get out of Australia. You know, and you know, like if you think about like soccer stars, you know, like if you want to be, become big in soccer, it's not going to be playing for Perth Glory. It's going to be playing for a Premier League team. So. In some ways, if you focus on kind of Australian stuff, you're always going to be a little bit behind the eight ball. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, when you're talking about like libertarian thinking in Australia, that's a pretty small pool. And when you start talking about, well, we're not going to do culture wars, we're just going to kind of do policy type stuff. I mean, that's even smaller. I mean, I mean something like the IPA podcast, so the, the Institute for Public Affairs, they have their own podcast. And, you know, they're probably one of the bigger organizations for kind of libertarian or li- liberty thinking in Australia. And even then, like they, uh, there's, there, there's, it's not just a solid sort of half hour of just policy wonkery. It's actually, I mean, it's it's much more sort of young and feisty and more more culture warsy type stuff. So, I think if 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 you want to go for like a libertarian focus, like a really kind of like you can have a small group. I think for if you sort of do culture wars, like that broadens the appeal because then you're sort of getting like free market conservatives and you're kind of getting other stuff. You get other people who might be interested in people who sort of you just don't like the left and maybe might be more interested in, in hearing libertarian ideas. I mean, that's something I, from what I understand is your mission is to sort of reach out to, to those kinds of people who maybe if you say, oh, you know, taxation is theft or, you know, talk about Ayn Rand or you talk about like the, the, the nuts and bolts of anarchy, they're going to have no interest. But if you sort of say, well, these lefties are kind of dumb, you know, for these X, Y, Z reasons, then, you know, whether that's right or wrong. They're, they're going to be more interested in what you have to say. So I think uh, it, it comes down to kind of which markets you target. Um, so ours is probably much more niche than a lot of others. Um, but that's kind of just where we're at. As, as I said, you got to do what you're passionate about. So um, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, I, I kind of, I think there is room for libertarian populism. Uh, I think, 
libertarianism has an, an attitude that I think kind of gels with people. Like if you say politicians suck and big, big companies suck, which I think is kind of broadly in line with libertarian ideas of well, definitely with the politicians, but also with kind of cronyism and that kind of stuff that resonates with people that resonates with people in a big way. And, and I think if you sort of have a libertarian kind of focus on those sorts of things, which in some ways, I guess Ron Paul did, um, you know, he didn't really do culture wars. He really just did kind of libertarian populism. Mostly. I think people dug that. And, and so I guess maybe that's for me, in the long term, what I'd like to see happen is, is libertarians sort of get into that space of, of having their own identity within the mainstream, which is kind of like, yeah, we, we, we take on everybody. Like we don't hold any, we don't pull any punches on anything. We're, we're principled and we're fired up and we want to promote the ideas that we think are, are true and right. So, yeah. yeah. Well, that's the key thing. We want to create uh, more libertarians. And obviously yeah. the thing we're trying to constantly improve is communicating liberty because we have, uh, that session at the Freedman Conference every year about communicating liberty where we have speakers yeah. saying, like, I know the exact way. And, you know, we come back every year, we're in, this, yeah. in the same <laughs> position. But sort of yeah. what, what, what I've sort of learned is that people, you know, they're, they're completely disengaged in politics. They hate it. They, yeah. you know, just want to go and live their lives. You really got to give them a reason to be involved. And they, they, the conclusion that I've basically drawn is if you've got to, you know, get them like, you know, they're being, you know, screwed over by politics. Like you've got to give them reason, like, God, that's so outrageous. I want to go out yeah. and do something about it. And that's why I think Ron Paul was successful because it was after like the, you know, uh, Iraq war. Uh, it was during the financial crisis. And, you know, even though he was, you know, t uh, talking about the Fed, which like most people consider like an obscure thing, he was saying, you know, this is the reason why you're being, you know, sc screwed over. And, yeah. You know, they, you believe that, you know, Obama's, you know, anti-war and uh, anti, you know, drug war. Well, he, well, he's not, you know, I'm the, the actual person. And that, you know, gave yeah. gave people a reason to, to get involved. And that, that was, uh, I, I think he, he really, you know, cut a cut through. And it's it's just a shame that we've sort of lost it in, in recent years. Yeah, I mean, I think the other thing about Ron Paul is it kind of united libertarians as well, because like his campaign was very much very focused on government policy, you know, and, and the divisions within the kind of libertarian crowds are often not about that. Like if you say to any group of any mix of libertarians, like monetary policy sucks, you know, like a, the government's distorting the, the, you know, prices in money or the, you know, like the uh, foreign policy sucks. Like everybody agrees. Like you could get Tom Woods and, and, you know, Cato guys and the Center for Stateless Society all on the same page on a lot of those things, broadly speaking, which is kind of what Ron Paul did. Like he didn't, he didn't have like, this is the exact hundred point plan that I'm going to take. Like it was broadly speaking, a kind of a broad approach, um, broadly speaking, broad approach. Anyway. Um, so people could kind of get behind that and be excited by it. Um, even if, you know, maybe you weren't so enthused by kind of his career earlier. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, that, that can make for an exciting movement, but it's probably not like sustainable in the long term. Like I, I guess, as we sort of seen, I mean, I mean, I mean, Ron Paul's still around. It's not like he disappeared, but uh, I think uh, after that campaign kind of ended, and sort of that momentum behind him as a candidate and as a unifying figure kind of disappeared as well. Which is, I mean, I, I don't think that's a necessary problem. Like, I don't think we need a grand unified theory of kind of libertarian activity. Like, I think everybody can kind of do their own thing. Like, you can do your thing, I can do my thing. Maybe there's some like, you know, left libertarians who like want to do like their own thing. I think, you know, that's great. Like let, let everybody, let a thousand flowers bloom. Like I always find it weird that libertarians are so much like we need to give freedom and opportunity and let, let all these like options occur in the market. But then when we talk about like libertarian ac activism, it has to be like a single way. Like it can only be this way. Well, no, like be excited for like whatever anybody's doing. If they're doing it, you know, you know, in good faith and with excitement and, you know, willing to sort of give it a risk. Well, then I, I think that's a great thing. So I don't think, we need to sort of rally behind a singular figure. Um, there is no Messiah to come and like take us to the land, you know, the, the promised land of liberty. It's going to be muddled and messy and not going to be clear, obvious sort of, uh, you know, lines of causality. Like, you know, this thing happened and this thing happened. And then we're all free. Like, it's going to be a bunch of different things. And I mean, I guess depending, you know, like how you think about something like gay marriage. Like I'm, I'm in favor of it being legalized. Uh, obviously, like some some people aren't. But I mean, I think broadly, like if you look at that, it's not 
you know, like the Libertarian Party in the 70s was behind gay marriage, you know, back in 1971. And, you know, I'm sure you could go back even further and find libertarians who supported it. And yet now it's become this mainstream movement. It's not even really part of, like, libertarians who say, well, this is only because of us. Like, it's things can change in culture that there's no, it's not necessarily always clear, like, how it happened. But libertarians have still been there going, this is the thing we should do. We should do this thing. Um, So, yeah, I I guess I'm not, yeah, you know, we don't need to necessarily be unified. We can just kind of do our thing. And, we'll, and and value that and say one of the, you know, if we just do a million different things, maybe one of them will work. Maybe one of them will get more, you know, help some people become more libertarian. So um, there's not really much else that can be done. I mean, I don't think anybody else has invented a better way of, of kind of creating change than just a decentralized process where everybody kind of gives it a go. Now, let's uh, take a bit of time to talk about you personally. Now, a lot of people would uh, consider you to be a a left libertarian with your uh, some of your public commentary, but you're actually uh, a devout Christian. So can you yeah. explain how, how that all fits in together? Yeah. Uh, so, so I'm a, uh, a conservative, uh, reformed, reformed in the sort of Calvinist, not reformed as in like having changed. Uh, like I didn't, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I became a Christian at 16 um, and, you know, just read the Bible a lot and, and, thinks that Jesus is God's son sent to rescue people. So, you know, I think I'm a very standard, orthodox, conservative, theologically conservative Christian uh, who also happens to be the like a real radical kind of anarchist, hardcore sort of uh, Lockean anarchist. So uh, it's sort of a bit of a weird combination, uh, I think. I mean, I think some of it is that people have certain ideas about what it looks, what it looks like to be a right libertarian or a left libertarian. So if you say, well, on the basis of property rights, which is usually like a conservative libertarian thing, say on the basis of property rights, I think Australia was invaded, which is something we we debated a couple of times on, on taking liberties. Um, you know, my point is that, well, if you think that property rights, you know, that, that homesteading creates rights, those rights are inviolable, the state has no right to come in and take your property without your consent uh, or without compensation, well, then... I don't see why that doesn't apply to Aboriginals. And yet when you say that, whether whether you think I'm right or wrong, whether you, when you say that, a lot of people say, oh, well, you're a left libertarian. Okay, whatever. Like, I I, I think it's just, like, li- libertarians, I mean, all people, all groups have a tent pension to say, well, if I disagree with you, that's because you're one of those bad people. Um, and I, I think, I think it's a bit weird, like, firstly, because, like, if you're an individualistic philosophy, you say, well, what does it mean to be individualistic? Like, surely on that basis, like every person's going to have a different set of, set of ideas. So unless you self-identify as left libertarian, which some people do, and that's fine, and some people identify as right libertarian, and that's fine as well. Uh, I think it's we just sort of say, well, you are this group, and I'm going to put you in this box, and I'm going to ignore you because you're in this box now, which is something I've often seen when I've come out in favor of uh, gay marriage. I've written an article for the for the Spectator, which essentially defended legalizing gay marriage on the basis of religious freedom and uh, belief, more or less belief in hell. Like if you believe in hell and you don't think the government should stop people from not believing, like if they're not going to hell, which is, you know, the liberal model of, of the relationship between the state and religion. Um, well then really that, I think there's a basis to then say, we should stop you from getting anything else. Really. If the state can't tell you who God is and the state can't tell you anything in my view, but somehow that may be like this weird, like left libertarian amongst some people, which I, I just find it odd. I mean, it doesn't really bother me. I mean, it's just it's e- often easier to create. And this is my beef with the, the, the culture war is that it's often a way of just kind of creating goodies and baddies. And while I'm a baddie because I believe in, you know, Australian invasion, I believe in legalizing gay marriage. Well, I don't have to listen to you because you're a baddie and I'm a goodie so I can do my thing. And, and vice versa, you know, I'm sure for left libertarians, they think, well, you're one of these crazy Ron Paul Mises Institute people. And I don't have to listen to you because, uh, you know, because you're a baddie and I'm a goodie. Uh, I try to take people as individuals, I take, the, take them as they would best portray themselves, um, you know, try to be fair to people. And I'm not always fair because I'm just human and I'm sure I've been rough to people. But I, I think uh, treating people as individuals is really important. And so, uh, and I think I think with non-libertarians, we're often like that. You know, like if, if you're with your conservative mates, and you're a libertarian, you know, like actual sort of Tory conservatives, and they start attacking the left for 
for a reason, you know, because they uh, are, think the cops should, you know, because like, they're, they're, they're anti-cop. You say, well, actually, you know, there's reasons to be like not like not highly happy with how the cops behave, you know, for these reasons. You know, it, you, you sort of, and, and vice versa with your kind of progressive mates, they'll say, oh, you know, these banks suck. You're like, well, maybe the banks aren't so bad. Um, I just, yeah, I think that comes out of like a, the ordinary instinct for libertarians is to kind of try to see it from the, the other side. And I just try to do that with other libertarians as well and just sort of take them as they come. And uh, as you mentioned before, you're a, a student and you are lucky enough yeah. to get uh, a scholarship from the uh, Mankile uh, Economic Education Foundation, which is mm. a lovely, uh, benevolent uh, free market organization uh, in Perth, where, where you're yep. from. Uh, and you, you were lucky to be sent by them to the Montperrin Society, which is sort mm. of, uh, what, what would we say, the... the well, it's an academic club, yeah. really? Yeah. Well, it, it's sort of like the stone cutters of the <laughs> free market movement. <laughs> If only it had like more rings and more rituals, that'd be more fun. Mm. No, it's so, I mean, Mancal, if you're not aware who Mancal are, they, um, so they're started by a guy called Ron Manners, who's made his money in gold mining. Uh, he became a libertarian. Uh, he, I think he was a teenager when his, because the, the, the company he owns is like, uh, he, you know, his, his parents, you know, like his father worked at it, created it, I think. And um, he was unloading parts from boxes you know, the, the stuff they'd imported and the parts were wrapped in the Freeman, which was like the Foundation for Econo Education's magazine. So basically this libertarian literature was wrapped up, you know, all these parts were wrapped up in libertarian literature. And he was like, started reading it and he's like, this is amazing, you know. And then so he contacted uh, Leonard Reed, who was then the uh, the president and had correspondence with him and just became, a, sort of got more into libertarianism through that. And this is, I think, in the, the 50s or the 60s, you know. So, um yeah, very like he's a really interesting guy. He's really uh, well. He's funded dozens of students to go to free market think tanks and to libertarian think tanks uh, across the world to learn about the ideas of freedom. And and yeah, it's just it was a brilliant thing. It's a brilliant organization. Like if you're in Western Australia and or you know people in Western Australia, make sure you get them in contact with Mancal. Like they run seminars for students. They're really great. Um, so yeah, uh, they they do international scholarships and, and they do scholarships for conferences. So they sent about 30 people, I think, 25, 30 people to Friedman this year. Um, and uh, then uh, they sent about eight of us to the Mont Pelerin Society, which, yeah, is an academic club. It's It was started after World War Two. Two. Yeah. yeah, World War Two. yeah. Um, by Milton Friedman, Ludwig Mises, uh, F.A. Hayek, you know, like, all these nobodies really like nobody's really heard of them, all these Nobel Prize winning economists. And basically they, they wanted they were like, we this you know, they, they wanted to promote the ideas of liberty and they saw this as an opportunity for people to bring people together to think about how can we advance the thinking of liberty. Um so it was kind of a pioneering organization now. Like now we have myriad think tanks, like more think tanks that you can poke a stick at. But back then it was really just kind of them and maybe like Fee was started around about the same time. You know, that was the beginning of kind of this huge explosion in libertarian thinking that we've seen through think tanks. So that was really great. It's a pretty serious organization with some pretty serious people. Uh, there was like a, a former five, four-star general, U.S. general there. There was, I think everybody had a PhD except me and like the other students. Um, you know, it's a pretty high-powered conference and it was a really great experience actually. So um, if you're in Western Australia and uh, you're keen to sort of learn more about economics and you're at university, make sure you get in touch with them about the next one. Cause I think it happens every year. I don't know if they'll send people every year, but uh, yeah, Ron's a big, well, he's a member of the organization, a big supporter of it. So yeah. And also yeah, the ILS, which was a, an internship in Canada where they, uh, they work with students, they do seminars, they do conferences. And it was really great to go to Canada and kind of see like the libertarian scene over there and, and how it's different and how it's the same. I mean, obviously they have a lot of benefits from being so close to the U S border. Um, you know, it's easy to fly in speakers um, and, you know, get speakers and go over to conferences over there. So Matt, the, the executive director, he's, you know, quite regularly going down and meet, meet potential sponsors in the U S. So, um, yeah, it was brilliant, really great organization. So, yeah. 
Now let's turn to uh, more contemporary political developments. Now, at the moment, nearly everyone's got an opinion on the direction that Australia is heading. I mean, yep. some people think, or uh, I think we both agree that, you know, economically we're not going in the, the right direction. Uh, civil liberties uh, are, are always under attack. But, yeah, probably mm. the the issue where we differ, differ the most on, we've already touched on it, is the, the culture wars. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I don't know if we ever didn't explicitly, like, talked about the culture wars per se. I mean, I, I wrote an article, so Liberty Works, uh, the the Brisbane do tank, approached me to write an article on on my thoughts on libertarianism and, and the, the culture wars. And my my view is that it's generally a distraction and it's often, it's kind of counterproductive because it's really about, as I said, sort of creating good guys and bad guys and it's often about sort of outrage, you know, so like it's not... I'm, a, I'm an outwardly focused kind of person. Like when it comes to meeting people who don't think like me, like I, I try to persuade them. And I, I find generally speaking that the culture was this kind of within your own tribe. So I often point to sort of Andrew Bolt and Wally Daly who uh, really are not like stellar thinkers or speakers. I mean, I guess Wally at least pretty like charismatic, but like they're not even that original as writers. Like they don't write stuff where it's like, oh my goodness, I can't believe no one's ever thought like that. You know, they, they just write stuff that's regurgitating all the same, you know, talking points that you've heard a billion times before, but they're just kind of really good at it. They kind of sit in that median spot of like dead in the middle where like everybody kind of can sort of rally around them. And I think that's because the culture was as much about like saying to people in your tribe, we are right, those people are wrong, how good are we, you know, and how, how mad are we that those bad people over there are destroying our good world? And I don't think that's helpful. I don't, I mean, like there's, there's, oh, of course, room for discussion about culture. Like, I mean, we, we're, we're going to probably do it like in a second when you, you, you have a reply. Like, I love talking about culture. I love talking about ideas, but it's about the meeting of people who are different rather than saying, me saying to you, aren't we right? And those people are dumb. Um, and I, I just find that counterproductive. And I, and I think for libertarians, we kind of sit in this weird spot on the political spectrum where we kind of have a bit of everything. I mean, that's kind of our main selling point often in politics is, oh, we're, you know, we're, we're economically conservative and socially liberal. That's why we're so great. You can have a bit of, you can have the best of both worlds. Well, if you're saying progressive suck or conservative suck, and that's like, that's your message. Well, then it's going to be hard to go to conservatives and say, well, yeah, we agree on this economic stuff. When I've just spent like however many months calling you like a disgusting human being because you love Trump, you know, or vice versa. Like, how can you go to a green and say, look, we agree on the security state. I mean, someone like, um, uh, what's his name? Um, the senator from WA got kicked. Scott um, Ludlum. Scott Ludlum, yeah. The only, up until sort of Lionhelm came to the Senate, he was the only guy talking about security stuff. And only guy, as far as I'm aware. And sure, the rest of his economics might suck. Like, they I mean, he's a, he's a green, like, you know, this, you know, they expect so much, but like, at least on this one issue, at least on this one issue, we can get together with him and say, look, we support what you're trying to do. We want some oversight. We want some accountability. You know, we don't, we don't think we need this, this heavy hand of, of the surveillance state. But if you're constantly calling him, you know, a commie piece of shit or whatever, like, he's not going to want to listen to you. So for, for libertarians, I think we, we, we sit in the spot where we could easily reach out to both groups. But if we're just isolating ourselves in a tribe, in a conservative tribe or in a progressive tribe and saying the other tribes suck, it's going to be very hard to have that outreach. Uh, I, I, defi I definitely agree that, you know, you should, like people who, you know, you consider on the, the opposite side of you politically, you should, you know, concede where they, you know, do make good points or, you know, you can say, you know, they do mean well, I just, you know, disagree with, you know, what, what mm. they're uh, proposing. But I've, I I disagree that, you know, you, you seem to uh, say that, you know, oh, it's invented this culture war, you know, by the media, these, you know, personalities having a go at each other, where it's sort of, for, for me, it's, it's it started you know on the ground i mean uh, the reason why i got involved in the culture was is because i saw you know these uh, as they term social justice warriors taking over university say, uh, you know saying how you know horrible and you know racist and sexist our you know society is and i was like whoa like you know in everyday life you know everyone gets along with everybody like i didn't know that you know our society was you know so evil and you have you know these 
uh, people who were influ influential, like Anita Sarkeesian, because she actually said that, you know, everything is racist, everything is sexist, everything is homophobic. Sure. And it's like, well, you know, these people are really trying to you know, basically, you know, tear society apart and like rebuild it. And that that's, that, that's the reason why I think the culture was important because there's people, you know, wanting to basically, and, and this is why this term cultural Marxism has emerged because it's, it's not so much a, a, an attack on, you know, government, it's an attack on, you know, how we know society a, a, as we know it today. We thought we were on the path to, you know, something good, but then we're told suddenly uh, it's awful. Yep. And, and like uh, uh, one of the responses I got when I wrote that article was, well, do you must not, it was more or less they said, well, you just might not have any beliefs about these things. And I'm like, well, of course I do. Of course, when a lot of these, particularly lefties, I mean, I'm, I'm a conservative Christian. Like, it, it, as an extent, which I'm like, I'm, like I'm, I'm much more tolerant than, say, a lot of others because I'm like, hey, let's decriminalize drugs. Let's decriminalize prostitution. But, like, to a large extent, I'm still, like, culturally conservative in that regard. So, it's, of course, I don't always agree with people on the left or on the right. I think for me, it's just the question I always ask is, like, if we lived in a truly free world, like if there was no government or, you know, there was, if we, if we demonopolized government, you know, if anybody could start a government, would, would this person still exist? And the answer is quite often yes. So, like, if there was no state to tell you, you know, what to think about anything, would there be Anita Sarkeesian? Well, yeah. Would she still be annoying? Probably. Would she be able to hurt me? No. So the point at which, like, I guess... For, a libert for me as a libertarian, I want to think, well, okay, I, I don't need to engage with all that other stuff. Like, I mean, maybe I will just because it's interesting. Like, you know, I, I, I try to sort of be open-minded and there's the possibility that I'm always wrong about anything. So to an extent, I want to try to be a little bit open-minded and say, well, maybe there is some stuff here that I should take on board. But broadly speaking, if I don't agree with it, I don't need to be mad that it exists. And I think so much of the culture war is just being mad that there's people out there who disagree with me uh, or, you know, that disagree with the you on like anybody on this like cultural thing and so much of it is about you know being mad that there's lefties well I, okay what what are you planning to do to them like you, i mean if you, if they're not going to be persuaded like i mean if i think persuasion's always good like if you want to say well we're going to talk about these things we're going to talk about you know uh, anita sarkeesian's views on games and i'm going to come up with a rebuttal that sort of seriously goes through the, her criticism and addresses them in a serious way i think that's great that's that's fantastic but that's very different from saying, look at this stupid woman. Look at what a stupid thing she says. We need to not have this person around. Well, that's not going to persuade them to not be like that. You know, like, and, and, and for a lot of people, they're not ever going to be persuaded of, of a different view. Like, I, I don't imagine Andrew Bolt is ever going to be like, here, you know, Bob Brown's going to say something and Andrew Bolt's going to be like, oh, my God, amen, I see the, you know, you know. Like, he's, he's probably not going to change. And so, like, being mad that Andrew Bolt exists or being mad that Waleed Ali exists is not like helpful solution i'd rather just get on with my own life i'd rather get on with like things i don't need to care about like i don't need to care that well Ed 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 is a self-righteous dick like it's not a problem like i can get on with my life without with him being around now if he gets the state involved that's a different kettle of fish so anytime that so in that regard like i guess they're probably i have a bit more sympathy with some of what you're saying about cultural marxism because often the people who are like that are also trying to get the state involved and so in that regard i think libertarian has a very strong response which is Ain't no way you should be doing that. But that's separate from the discussion of whether cultural Marxism is a thing or what they really think. Because those people who exist in anarchy, if you, if you had no government, those people would still exist. They still may be stupid, but they'll still be around. And so I can just get on with my life because I can ignore them. I can just turn that bit of Facebook off or don't, you know, I don't need to read what they say. I could just get on with doing whatever I'm doing and, and focus on the things that I think are important. And if, those people don't like me well okay so what i'm i'm a big boy like physically and hopefully emotionally uh so i guess that that's kind of my pitch is rather than spending so much energy being wound up by all these people you don't like just kind of get on with your own life i mean if if they try to use the state okay that's that's a point at which you say okay we need to resist this but if they're just going to be idiots and they're not going to listen and you don't feel particularly inclined to actually kind of reach out to them and sort of Caught, like carefully, you know, treat them, like, uh, deal with their, their arguments seriously. Well, then why bother? Why just spend, why not spend that energy and time on something that's like more important or like more productive? Um, I mean, being outraged is fun. 
being fired up is fun. I mean, everybody likes being fired up and, and libertarians are no different. Like we get fired up about the government. You know, we see that this cop breaks up this lemonade stand and we're like, oh my God, they're going to smash the state. How dare they do this to the children? You know, and we get filled with outrage. And, and you know, to an extent that's justified because it is the state getting involved. But a lot of it's just because that's our personal set of preference. Like we don't get, this is a, I don't necessarily get bothered by Anita Sarkeesian, but if, you know, Bernie says the minimum wage should go up. I just love to be feel the, the the warm glow of outrage. It's fantastic. You know, it's wonderful. It's it's fills you with a sense of purpose. But I just want I I think otherwise we should just sort of get on with with life and with things. So now probably the uh, one phenomenon over the past year which you know divided the libertarian movement more than anything was the uh, emergence uh, or the election of Donald Trump as president mm. there were you know uh, libertarians who thought you know he was the the worst thing ever and then there was you know, uh, you know the libertarians who thought you know this is exactly you know what we've been looking for you know the great disruptor now yeah. you you were obviously you know quite uh, critical of Trump Do you, uh, yep. you obviously still stand by that Yes, yes. I think uh, I'd I'd have I'd be less critical if I didn't think that good things are happening just because it's just like random chance or that Donald Trump's not really paying attention and there's just things going on that it's kind of good because he doesn't understand the process enough to sort of get involved. So I think I think Trump's active statements, like what he actually says should happen, is almost universally terrible. Uh, so good th- if there's good things about deregulation or less regulation, I mean, because I don't think he's saying he's a deregulator. I think it's just the regulatory apparatus is not growing to the same extent it was. Is more probably by chance, and I don't know if it's going to be like a long term trend. So I, I don't have much confidence in that kind of thing. I mean, I, I welcome it if it happens. You know, if, you know, you see here about how regulation grew by a much smaller amount than previously. I mean, that's good. Like I want that, but I. I I think one of the issues that we we see with saw with Obama and what will happen with Trump is it's easily overturned if you don't get the congressional support. So the reason why Trump's able to go through with his pen and his phone and overturn all this stuff is because Obama used his pen and his phone. Well, that just means that whoever comes next, which is probably going to be a Democrat, uh, is just going to be able to do the same. So like I, I think you know uh, political change by government fiat is not a solution. It's just a band-aid and the real solution is getting Congress on board to have in, implement real change. And Donald Trump is never going to be able to do that because he just, well, I don't think he will be able to do it because he doesn't know how to engage with those people. I mean, you look at how he's going about healthcare. It's just completely haphazard. I mean, I don't even know if you could find a single instance of him actually explaining the details of his, the policy that his own party is putting forward. Not that there's a coherent set of ideas there necessarily to begin with, but like, you know, Obama, at least Obama, for all of his flaws, you can probably find half a dozen videos of him actually going, okay, this is how my healthcare law will work. Um, he was a, he was across the details of a lot of what he did, even if what, a lot of what he did was like awful or stupid. Um, Donald Trump is not doing that. And so I, I, and as he becomes more unpopular, like if he actually genuinely becomes unpopular, which to an extent he is already, but like I think if, if he sours on his own base, He's never going to get anything done. You know, it's kind of, and I think the point of comparison that I've heard, um, uh, particularly the guys like Matt Welch at Reason make, uh, is he's going to end up like um, uh, Schwarzenegger, who came in as this, you know, great reformer, this great outsider, as you know, California governor, you know, lots of sort of red meat Republican type stuff, and then he got absolutely smashed in the midterms, um, and he just kind of retreated because he lost the congressional majority he had, and. He doesn't really believe in anything. So, yeah, I, I'm still pretty critical of Trump. Um, I don't see much positive stuff. And then when you get to the actual, like, things he's promoting, it's awful. It's, like, as bad as it, you could have imagined before. You know, he is... I, I mean, I struggle to think of a single thing that he said in public remarks that was actually kind of praiseworthy. It's all just boorish, buffoonish... Uh, hot air. Um, I don't know. Like, what do you? I mean, is, can you like? I'm, I, but I'm hoping to be wrong. So, like, is there something that you like look at? You say, okay, Trump said this one thing about, and it, that was like a right thing to say. 
There was a lot of people misunderstand the libertarians who, you know, back Trump. It's not because, you know, we saw him as, you know, the great you know, libertarian messiah. It's, it's yeah. because we, you know, saw him as, you know, the, the disruptor. And, yeah. you know, he, he was, you know, really going to, you know, sh shake things up. I mean, the whole political establishment, you know, was against him. So clearly they were felt their power threatened in some way and yep. so that that's that's always a good thing and the fact that we knew exactly what we were going to get with hillary clinton and that wasn't sure good. yeah we were, we were going to get you know the first amendment gutted we we're going to get the second amendment gutted you know it wasn't going to be good with uh with hillary we were guaranteed of that with trump and he even said this himself and it was when he was trying to win over you know african-american voters you know what do you have to lose and that was the attitude like you know he <laughs> he may turn out to be you know, uh, terrible, but you know, it's yeah. it's worth a shot. Like he's, yeah, he's obviously saying you know things that we disagree with. But he's also saying, uh, you know, so, some good things as well. And of course, you know, the political incorrectness and the fact that you know he was you know behaving erratically, like that was, uh, I I thought that was a good thing because you yeah. know he was, he he was you know. Uh, basically you know sticking it to like the media and the the politicians who'd failed us for the past you know 40 years and yeah. also the fact that i think he's you know there are there are some supporters who you know as the expression goes are you know mindless zombies who just go along with whatever whatever he says but the especially the libertarians who back trump they're not afraid to criticize him like when he felt like sure. when he yeah, fights. Yeah. for example the the syria strike like there was so many libertarians and uh even just you know like oh what, what you'd say you know, reformed conservatives, like, for example, Ann Coulter, she immediately turned on Trump, you know, after the, the Syria strike, and she's been pretty cr critical of him, you know, ever, ever since. So I think, you know, uh, Trump supporters, are, you know, they're, they're critically thinking a lot more that people give them credit for. Sure. Uh, and I mean, obviously, the political correctness stuff, like, that's not my jam. Like, so, I, I mean, I can see if, if you're into, like, sticking it to, to the mainstream, obviously, Trump's gonna have a lot of value. For me, that's, there's no value in that. I mean, I think if if it was if that was supported by say like a you know Ron Paul you know the dream libertarian candidate almost uh, you know like he if he if he'd managed to win he would be that outsider he would have stuck it to the media but like it kind of would be backed up with sort of a core set of ideas that at least kind of had some some real kind of substance to it I guess for me I mean the the point that I've heard made is you know Trump will say will believe whatever he was told last and I. I it's hard. I mean, it's really hard to sort of say how that's not true. Like, I think it's, you know, like he go he talks to the, the the Chinese president, and all of a sudden he's a big fan of China. You know, he talks to, you know, he goes and lays hands on the great orb in Saudi Arabia, and you know, sends them billions of dollars of guns. Like, it's, you know, it, it's it's all good and well to have this disruptor, but if the disruptor doesn't actually kind of lead to something kind of coherent and positive and some sort of actual agenda even in some small way, that it's really not disrupting for any purpose. It's just throwing the cat amongst the pigeons and you just, yeah, he's going to more like a couple of the pigeons, but it's not going to change the outcome of the affair. Like, it's not like the the growth, like people are going to get to the end of Trump and go, oh my goodness, this big government stuff, this is terrible. How dare, this is, this is an abomination. We should have never done this. They're just going to go, well, I wish my own strong man had won, you know, and you just end up trading, you know, one, one, one person who believes in the absolute power of the sovereign government, you know, for another. And I, I don't think that necessarily leaves you in a better place. Um, I guess we'll see. But as libertarians, we automatically have, you know, incredibly low expectations of politicians. Sure, yeah. So, so, <laughs> so yeah. if Trump can, you know, marginally improve things on, on what they were before, I mean, that's, yeah. still, that, that's still a big achievement, even yeah. if it's, like, in the scheme of things, not much. Sure. I mean, I, and I think I said this about Brexit as well. Like, I, I'm, for these sorts of things, I'm always a bit of a wait and see. Like, something like Brexit and Trump could go either way. We won't actually sort of see what will happen until it kind of plays out. And for Trump, I mean, it feels like the longest bloody year of American politics, but it's not even been a year. You know, like, it's, I'm going to be exhausted by it by the end of, if he managed to get through four years, which I'm actually skeptical he will, because I think eventually he'll lo lose his position you know, like you know like i mean they're going to get absolutely drilled in the midterms and that's going to be a huge problem for trump so i guess we'll see what happens when it happens i mean and that's that's just not like that's not just specifically him like i think that's true i mean it was true of bush it was true of obama like i've looked going back to hw and 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 clinton i mean clinton yeah he lost in the midterms so you know generally speaking you'd expect a change in the in the house and then in the senate at some point
uh, probably actually probably said it first, and then it becomes a very different proposition. And then what does Trump do? So it's it's sort of hard to know where it will go. And Trump is just so erratic; it's hard to sort of get a beat on how this is going to play out. I mean. When Bannon was there, you kind of had a, like that had a certain vibe. Now Bannon's gone. You've kind of got all the generals. <sighs> Trump wakes up in the morning and reads something like watches Fox and Friends, and then well, what then what happens? Like it's it's really it is kind of erratic, and I I hope that it's as good as as what I think the libertarians who support Trump will be. Uh, I, I I don't to an extent I don't even disagree. Like about the whole thing about Clinton being really bad. I mean, obviously I hated Hillary Clinton. I mean, it's hard to, she's just an inhuman like piece of filth from another dimension. That's somehow in politics. Like she is really one of the worst things ever in politics in terms of just kind of really cynical. Ugh, ugh. Um, whether that's whether Trump actually ends up being any better. We'll see. Hopefully he does. I can understand why libertarians would be interested in that chaos I'm probably less interested, but you never know. Weirder things have happened. I mean, Donald Trump did get elected. Like that's about as weird as it could possibly get. Is there room for more weirdness? Yeah, maybe. Well, Lee, uh, good luck with your continued media work and studies. I'll be posting links to uh, Taking Liberties and also Aussie Liberty on the show notes page, so hopefully we can get some more people watching you. I'm glad we can still disagree at times, often yeah. ferociously, but still recognise <laughs> we're on the, the same time and, as the expression goes, have a respectful debate. Indeed. And uh, thank you very much for having me. It's been great being back on with you. And, and I'd love to come on any time you like, so feel free to hit me up and, uh, and I'm sure you we can find some more spicy disagreement to have. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Uh, Liberty Fest in Brisbane is now only a week away on Saturday the 14th of October 2017, uh, which we are a sponsor of. It is hosted by our good friends at Liberty Works. Uh, so don't forget, if you haven't got your ticket yet, you can get a 20% discount by visiting libertyfest.org.au using the coupon code LFUNSHAC, all caps. Thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.